morning. Yeah, let's make you do that a little more enthusiastic. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey. I hope everybody had a lovely evening last night, whatever you got up to. I hope you enjoyed the beautiful Portuguese food and wine. Um, and very, very happy to be here. My goodness, it's day three already. I can't believe it. I just wanted to make a few logistical notes. Whoops, I'm on the wrong page for that. Uh, the first one is that actually there's been something exciting going on that many of you may not know. On that table at the back, we've got some very talented artists who've been doing a graphic recording of all of the sessions, even of the breakout sessions that I believe were, there we go, just a little taste of what they're doing. That will be shared on the app and online um, so that people can really enjoy and, and have that as a, as a takeaway reminder of all of the interesting discussions that have been going on. So thank you so much to our artists, graphic recorders at the back. Another interesting thing that's been going on behind the scenes that you might not know about is a youth radio. We have some young people who have been doing a radio show. They've been doing some different interviews, following along with different things on the global forum. And you can find a link to that on the app. If you open the app and go into notifications, you can link right in. And, and listen to a little bit of the youth radio and hear some of their perspectives on the global forum. And speaking of the app, I bet everybody knows what I'm gonna remind you of, the survey. So there was the day one survey and the day two survey, which I'm sure every one of you have filled out very carefully. And there is now, of course, as well, a day three survey for you to fill out towards the end of the day today, but just to put it there in your mind. And if you, for whatever reason, have not yet filled out the day two survey, perhaps now is the time to do it. Shouldn't take very long. And then one final thing is that we have set up in the corner, just as you walk out to the coffee break, we set up kind of photo booth area with a backdrop and a selfie frame and props. So please do go ahead and, and use that. It was, we had it in Tanzania last year as just kind of an aside. And we had the best photographs that came out of that. Um, so I don't know if people have been using it this year, but it's there uh, and it's quite fun. So please do go ahead and use it. I think that's it for my logistical announcements. So I'm very, very um, delighted to welcome up to the stage Wevin Muganda, who's going to come and join me here just for some reflections on the forum so far and to look ahead to the day. Wevin is a youth advocate with UNICEF Generation Unlimited's Young People's Action Team. So welcome, Wevin. So Wevin, it's been great to have you and so many uh, other young people here to engage across the sessions. But before you tell us a little bit about your experience, I'd love if you could just introduce yourself and some of your work with Generation Unlimited. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here. I work in twofold. So I'm a youth advocate from Mombasa, Kenya. And uh, my work focuses on translating complex policies and concepts for different stakeholders with the aim of inspiring action. So on one end, I work with young people at the grassroots level, and I create opportunities for them to take social action on the issues they care about. So think about climate, think about peace building, education, health, nutrition, um, all of it, because young people care about many things. And at Generation Unlimited, I'm able to amplify the voices of the young people that I work with at the local level and ensure that they influence decisions, um, they influence policy makers, and most importantly, I'm able to co-create uh, through the youth public-private partnership. And um, I, I want to believe that you all see yourselves as peace builders because I'm a peace builder and education is one of the key priorities for peace building. It is a transformation process that allows young people to get the knowledge and transform their mindsets and also shape their perceptions of how they see themselves in society. For instance, I started my peace building in high school as a teenager, volunteering, um, planting trees and doing all of that. And I think if it wasn't for the teachers, I wouldn't have believed in myself um, as a leader. And so uh, the work that 
I do is really creating uh, spaces for learning, informal spaces of learning. Education is a priority, but we, we also have to understand that education can undermine peace building and peace processes. If this education is not equitable, if it's not accessible, if it continues to leave other young people at the margins and, and exclude them, it, it can, you know, drive conflict. And so, uh, you know, education has to evolve. It has to uh, be contextualized to the needs and the agency of different generations of learners. And to do this, we need skills right now, which is, you know, one of the initiatives at Generation Unlimited that really prepares young people for the world we live in now and the world we envision. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wevan, and I think that was such an important reminder that formal school systems are not always the force for equity and pluralism that, you know, we've been discussing and sort of dreaming of today. And that's quite relevant for our topic today, which is all around alternative pathways and non-formal education pathways for young people that are outside of the formal sector. We'll be focusing a lot on that um, through the next two panel sessions, as well as through some of our challenge workshops. But, you know, we also connect that with what we learned about from the formal system, because we can't see these as, as separate silos, as we spoke about on day one, because young people often move between formal and informal systems, of course, and even students enrolled in formal school, they have a life outside of school where they're doing a lot of learning and engaging in extracurricular activities and, you know, through their community involvement as well. So I think it's important to see the links between those. So I'd love to hear, um, Wevin, yesterday when you were here and participating in some of the discussions, what were some of the highlights for you in terms of understanding equity and pluralism and inclusion within those formal school systems? Thank you very much. I think the biggest highlight for me is that students were part of co-creating the solutions. And I think that speaks in the spirit of like youth meaningful engagement. We are here, we, we are subject experts at education and other topics, but really young people are the experts of their lives and they are the, you know, they have the lived realities. And so for me, just being able to engage meaningfully with the students and the experts and co-creating with them was a, a big highlight. And also uh, partnerships and coordination of efforts throughout the uh, table work or, or gallery work, able to see that um, different stakeholders are doing different things. And we need to avoid duplication of efforts. We need to maximize on the resources that we have. We have more issues than the resources that we have. And so only when we pull together, and again, just emphasizing the need for uh, meaningful partnerships and young people at the heart of these partnerships and you know, bringing public, uh, the public sector and private institutions as well. And also intergenerational leadership. I think it's it's been interesting to see how, uh, as part of the sessions, how young people are being included and acknowledging that we all have different expertise to bring to the table. And if we have to create something inclusive, it's not really about bringing young people in and kicking the older people out, but really making sure that it's a space for, for everyone. Um, and an intersectional approach to addressing social inequalities. Uh, at yesterday's dinner, we were talking about the climate education nexus. And it's interesting to see that it's not a climate issue or an education issue, but it's, we're, we're really talking about the same thing. We just have them in different thematic areas. So I think that was also um, a highlight for me. Um, listening, amplifying, and considering the voices of young people and learners and teachers in decision making. Many times we listen, many times we amplify, but I think we really need to do more in actually considering. So everything that teachers are saying here, everything that young people are saying here needs to make it to the policies, to the interventions, and finally, investing in solutions. Uh, I was really glad to hear the commitments, financial and technical commitments to the processes. I think I'll just leave it as you need to fund us young people like you mean it, like you want us to win. So thank you very much.
so, so well said. Thank you so much. And I agree that the, the really exciting thing about the Global Forum, I think, is the opportunity to bring young people, teachers, researchers, policymakers, all together into this kind of dialogue and discussion. And I think that is, for mes many of us, maybe all of us, really the real highlight um, of, of the event. So with that sort of collaborative spirit in mind, I'd just like you to take maybe two minutes to turn to the person next to you and reflect on some of your highlights yesterday and even from day one and what you're looking forward to today on our last day of the program. Thanks so much. Robin. All right, thanks everybody. I know, again, you could probably keep talking all morning, but we have other really interesting people to hear from as well. So if you can wrap up your reflections. I'm very, very excited to introduce our opening discussion panel today, which will be focusing on how we can promote equitable, inclusive, and pluralistic learning pathways for young people inside but also outside of the formal education system. And I'm delighted to welcome our panelists to the stage and under the guidance and chairing of the wonderful Jane Barlow, who I'm not sure, yes, because uh, Jane has, we're very um, grateful, Jane has graciously stepped in for Dr. Sugra Chowdhury Khan. So Jane will be chairing us today. Jane brings, um, is coming from the Global Center for Pluralism in Ottawa, Canada. And I turn it over to you. Oops. Let's grab some water here. There, I'll let you pour. Well, welcome everyone. Oh, good morning. I am so delighted to be moderating this morning's plenary. I think I have the best panel, um, featuring some really exceptional panelists. Um, as, as Bronin said, I am stepping in for our dear Sugar Khan, um, so I have some very large shoes to fill. I'm promising not to disappoint her. Um, but therefore, before I begin, um, and before I introduce our panel speakers today, um, I thought I should say just a few words about the Global Center for Pluralism. For those of you who are a little bit less familiar with our work or not at all, um, we, were, we are an international um, charitable organization based in Ottawa, Canada. And we were founded um, under a really unique partnership between His Highness the Aga Khan and the Government of Canada with the incredibly important and I would say ambitious mandate to support societies around the world to live productively and peacefully with diversity. We were um, very early supporters of uh, the conferences at Oxford uh, um, that AKF sponsored and I worked with Andy and Nafisa on these the, that, that really um, sort of set the groundwork for the development of the school's 2030 initiative. And so it's really exciting now to see all the achievements that have happened to date and I'm very pleased to see that pluralism has been retained as a central focus and theme throughout, throughout your work. Over the past two days, we have heard how much the education, academic policy, donor communities have really made an important shift in the recognition of the diversity that exists in all of our societies, communities, and classrooms. We have also, I think, heard a true commitment to advancing pluralism in education. 
At its core, pluralism is a positive response to diversity. It refers to the actions that we all take to respond positively to human differences as the basis of a more equitable, um, just and, and uh, successful and prosperous society. Nowhere is this more important than when working with adolescent learners who may have already experienced over a decade of being excluded based on differences in learning abilities, differences in ethnicity, language, gender, economic status, that has had an impact and will continue to impact their confidence, learning outcomes, and future potential to contribute to their societies. Equally, if not more importantly, we have also heard about the need to instill in learners the skills and habits of mind to engage across differences. In today's world, these skills to engage respectfully um, and productively across differences has never been more important as we seek to tackle some of the more existential challenges facing the world and the planet today, such as climate change. So let me introduce today's panelists. Um, we have um, our youth representative today, Darius, who is a student at a technical institution in Lisbon. He has been uh, working for the last two days with a, a group of his peers, and they have elected and nominated him to, to sit on the stage. And so um, we're really excited to hear from Darius. We also have David Yeager, who is associate professor at the University of Texas in Austin. He has a developmental psychology. He is a developmental psychologist uh, who focuses on methods to promote equity in education by addressing student motivation, engagement, and coping with stress. We have uh, Nadi, Nadi Albino, who is deputy director of partnerships with UNICEF. Uh, Nadi is an absolute leader in pulling together multi-sectoral partnerships and an avid programmer. We have Joanna Parsons, who is Director of Delivery and Impact with the Prince's Trust International. Uh, Joe believes deeply in preparing young people uh, for the future of work through holistic learning and strategic alignment to future career opportunities. She leads the delivery of the Princess Trust International's mandate across 18 countries, uh, working with partner organizations to support skills development from education to employment, and she thinks she has the best job at the Princess Trust. <laughs> and finally, um, we have Trisha Wind, who is program leader for GPE Knowledge and Innovation Exchange, or KICS, at the International Development Research Center, uh, otherwise known in Canada as IDRC, a low Canadian. Um, she is particularly interested in how to facilitate effective knowledge mobilization and how to scale positive impact in education systems. Great. So let me kick us off with a first round of questions to all of our panelists. Um, and I'm going to start with Darius. Um, Doris, you've been working together with a group of youth from across Portugal to discuss your priorities for inclusive societies in education in your country. Can you tell us a bit about your experience over the past two days and what you have discussed together with your peers? And please, everyone, um, Darius is going to answer in Portugal, so you might want to put your headsets on as he gathers his thoughts to answer this question. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, good morning to you all. Thank you for being here. These last two days are difficult to explain. These people didn't know each other, young people, uh, children even, young adults, students. And there's one thing that unites us, wanting to know more. And we want to know more the best way possible in ways that will allow us to achieve things that nowadays are difficult or that force us to undergo activities that wouldn't even be normal. 
to achieve goals that for many of us are asphyxiating somehow in a very young age. We didn't always agree, of course, we are human beings. And it was something that uh, filled my heart to witness the evolution of it. We were starting very shy, not knowing what to say, where to turn. In the end, there was only one problem, not being able to choose what to say today here, which is very good. Everyone brought something different to the table. We all brought uh, our view, uh, examples of them, something that is done well or done wrong. Uh, these are learnings that one way or another, uh, whether we are here talking to you or not, we will bring with us, make, to, trying to make a difference at our schools, in our lives. These are lessons that we will adapt, whether those were good or bad, we should learn from everything we can. I think that was the most special component, a place where young people could come together from Brazil, Kenya, Portugal, even though not uh, all together, we got together. We don't live together, but we got together. So we could talk and learn from each other and thus grow. Thank you. Joe, um, for Prince Trust International, your focus on inclusive education for youth is closely linked to your focus on holistic learning. Can you explain a bit more about that link? Sure. Thanks, Jane. Um, well, we know that research suggests that better education yields individual, higher individual income and contributes towards long economic growth uh, in various countries. But the importance of holistic learning can often be overlooked. Um, holistic learning in itself is the process that brings every part of the student together. So mind, body and spirit. Uh, learners' emotion, their intellect, creativity, and imagination and body are all activated uh, to bring forth a comprehensive and effective uh, learning experience. So holistic learning essentially allows students to create a connection to their subject matter. So it complements academic learning and gives young people the chance to better succeed in this, as well as develop better core skills for life outside of the educational setting. Now, Education can't be truly equitable uh, if individual factors are holding back students from reaching their full potential. And holistic learning really does help to mitigate this. So the ILO and others have pointed out that whilst young people are learning, they're not necessarily equipping themselves with the skills for the world of work after they leave school. They're missing key ingredients which are core skills, often referred to as life skills or soft skills, and without them, learning just can't be holistic. So um, holistic learning, again, by its nature, it's an excellent tool to support youth to be inclusive and equitable, as well as supporting teachers um, in how to use different techniques in the classroom that are engaging, involve more teamwork and more interactivity. Um, this is very hard, as we know, when teachers are teaching uh, students in classes of 60 upwards and may have received little training in that area. Um, so at the Prince's Trust International, our core education programme is a programme called Achieve, uh, and it really focuses on these core skills. It's modular, so it can be adapted, and it involves intensive teacher training with a focus on building new awareness, gaining a deeper understanding of holistic approaches, and skill building application of this as well. So an example of how Achieve might um, promote inclusion, I could refer back to some delivery of the programme in Ghana last year, where we developed new content material focusing on understanding disability. Uh, we found that as well as being massively impactful to the students, actually this was uh, incredibly meaningful for the teachers who had had little to no experience or exposure to those with disabilities. Um, and as well as developing the content with teachers and with young people by understanding what they did and they didn't know, we then partnered with the Special Olympics um, who supports youth with intellectual disabilities and um, brought together all of this learning through sport in a sports day. Um, 
I think that this approach of working with m multiple stakeholders and local partners with real expertise is a really great example of how, how holistic learning can really be brought to life in a low cost and a high impact way. Um, now, we know that there are many programs out there that complement academic courses and classes, but the real key for me to bring these is to bring these approaches into the mainstream rather than just having them as an add on. So, what do we need? Well, we need funding to do this. We need educators to recognize the, their importance as well. And we really need governments to absorb them into curriculums as well. Thank you. Tricia, I understand that um, quite a number of the research initiatives funded through the KICS focus on inclusive learning, partnerships for adolescents. Can you tell us a bit more about this research portfolio and what we are learning from it? Yeah, thanks. So I think that Ian McPherson yesterday introduced you to uh, the Global Partnership for Education's Knowledge and Innovation Exchange. It's a program that I lead at the International Development Research Center. And there are two parts of KICS, and both of them have some connections in with uh, adolescent education. So on the one hand, there are four regional hubs through which people who work in today's national education systems come together for peer learning and exchange across the 85 different countries that are partners of GPE. So they come together for uh, sharing best practice or, or just challenges um, to reflect on existing evidence and good practice or to use the global toolkits that we all invest in and produce but maybe don't spend as much time in facilitating their use. They also do analysis uh, and capacity strengthening through communities of practice or learning cycles. So the topics that they focus on also inform them the calls for proposals on which we fund uh, applied research projects, of which there are a whole number in, um, connected to adolescent education. I thought though, before I would get to that, I just wanted to underline a couple of places in which KICS and Schools 2030 connect. Um, because that, for us, is a, a key part of why we're here. So seven of the 10 countries that are part of uh, Schools 2030 are partner countries of GPE, and so also invited to uh, participate in KICS. A number of the organizations that Schools 2030 works with, we also work with, um, and we both fund the Data Must Speak uh, initiative of UNICEF, a really fine example of a place that's looking for what really works uh, in different countries and how do you then identify, showcase, and scale that. Some of the people um, here at the Global Forum are also involved in KICS. In fact, two of the people on the panel yesterday, even if I don't include Ian, um, are, are involved in KICS. The, um, the Deputy Minister from Kyrgyzstan is involved in the, one of the regional hubs, and Professor Maida of Mombasa is involved in one of the research projects uh, on EdTech. And if you come to our challenge session, if I can put a plug in for that after this, you'll meet people from the Talon Forum who are doing some very interesting work uh, on digitization of education in Kyrgyzstan Tajikistan and Mongolia. I think we also have a similar approach in the very positive approach that Schools 2030 takes of really empowering and identifying what works at, an, at a local level and then showcasing that, documenting it so we can learn, um, but then also thinking about how to scale. And that's very much an approach that we take in the research portfolio of KICS where all the research that we fund takes an education system challenge, figures, identifies what are some of the existing promising or already proven approaches that address those challenges, how can they be contextualized, adapted, and explicitly scaled uh, so that can inform uh, better policy and practice. So when it comes to the adolescent education, uh, in Africa and Asia, we have a set of different projects that are researching ways to help teens either stay in school and finish, especially girls, but also providing pathways or access to alternative education and accelerated education for those who are out of school. A number of those models are started and sometimes managed by NGOs or people outside the Ministry of Education, sometimes because those populations are simply out of reach of the central ministry. But there are a lot of questions about how to scale them, about how do you maintain quality standards? What are options for governments to certify uh, the quality of education? And how can they scale into, uh, for broader populations, or how can they be sort of integrated into how the government uh, delivers education? There's a second set of projects that focus on gender equality, 
uh, a number of different issues that I hope I'll have time to speak to a little bit more later. And then also projects about learning assessment and how do we tackle assessing 21st century skills in secondary school. Fascinating. Thank you so much. <laughs> David. Um, can you tell us a little bit today about your research and what you were learning about inclusive, equitable learning opportunities for youth? Yeah, so <clears throat> there's been a kind of scientific revolution recently. Um, for a long time, the science of motivation has treated motivation as something that a kid either has or doesn't have. We've kind of tried to assess it as an individual difference or as a quality. And I think the last 10 years or so has changed the scientific view on that. Um, we, t we think more of the adolescent as someone who wants to learn, who wants to contribute to the world, who wants to change the world around them, but there are barriers, both uh, material and psychological, that can stand in the way. Uh, one of those barriers is a belief that only some people are smart enough to be worth investing in in education. That's a what my mentor, Carol Dweck, has called a fixed mindset belief. Um, and in the PISA, looking at 76 countries across the world, what they found is that the extent to which kids have internalized a fixed mindset, that they've learned from adults that only some people are smart and other people aren't, that there's nothing you can do, then they tend to perform worse. Um, but that uh, is only a starting point because in other experiments, what we've been able to do is to say, well, actually, abilities are dynamic, they're malleable, they can be grown and developed. And we've delivered what we call growth mindset interventions to young people to help them understand that the brain is, for example, like a muscle, something that could be developed and grown just like muscles can. And then what we found is that students from groups that have been stereotyped or marginalized are more likely to benefit from the educational experiences in front of them um, when you address that belief. And that's exciting, uh, but there, then there's a new challenge, and I think it's the newest set of findings that research really needs to focus on, and it's the following. Kids don't just walk around with a mental model of themselves as a learner. It's not just all in their head. They're also perceiving the culture in the classroom that they're experiencing. And you can think of adolescence as um, the world's greatest evolutionarily designed hypocrisy detectors. Right. If you say one thing and are doing something else or your culture is saying the opposite, then young people are the first to point it out. And that's if you're a teacher, I was a teacher, that's annoying for you in front of the classroom, you know, but in fact, that is their superpower. And rather than blaming the next generation for being too complaining too much, et cetera, I think what you instead need to say they are often perceiving what is right and just earlier and more clearly than we are as people who are established in our, and entrenched in our own hierarchies, et cetera. So I think the next generation of research needs to focus on how young people have that superpower. How do we harness it? And how do we help them help us create the kinds of inclusive classroom cultures in which all students know that they can learn and that they're worth investing in? Excellent. Thank you. Naji, um, the mission of Generation Unlimited is to skill the world's youth and connect them to opportunities for employment and social in impact. How does your work approach the question of equity and inclusion, and what is your approach to reaching young people in challenging contexts? Well, I think, firstly, um, we all have to be clear about the definition of inclusion and equity. Yeah. So different um, sectors define it very differently. Um, sometimes when we say equality, we mean it's about bringing girls and boys together. But